Ote is recording. Maybe, no, maybe put it here. Yeah, so are we there. are we audible? Are we audible? If um, we sit like this and stare at it, are we audible? We can just make weird eye contact. <laughs> weird eye contact, but you can't see weird eye contact on the. You can hear it. <laughs> you can hear it. Our uh, voices. So where are we? We're sitting next to the Richard Sarah at SF MoMA. Yeah, in this. One of his only, one of the only sculptures of his that I actually like. Really? <laughs> yeah. Not a huge fan. Um, the one at Dia Beacon. Have you been to Dia Beacon? Mm -mm. Is Dia Beacon's about forty-five minutes from where I grew up, and when I was having a bad day, I just go to Dia Beacon. <laughs> it's a really nice experience. So we're here because there are no women in SF MoMA. There are no women in SF MoMA, <laughs> and that makes it really nice to, to be. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, we're here because you've been coming over here and doing some projects. A oh project, yeah. And I just wanted to ask you to describe it and talk about it. Uh, I have been doing a project called. What did I call it? Oh, would you like to see an invisible sculpture? Um, I've done the performance eight times. So only three of them terribly, terribly failed. The rest of them are fine. Usually on Thursday nights. Mm -hmm, on Thursday night, just because it's open later, so there's right. more like local people here. Right. Um, and so basically, I usually stand either down here on this floor next to the Sarah or up on the fifth floor in one of the hallways. Um, and I would just stand there holding the HoloLens uh, in the middle of the hallway. And as people walk by me, um, just say sort of, would you like to see an invisible sculpture? Um, Before you continue, the first thing I'd like to say is that you are a member here. I am a member here. And that this project I give them falls my well within the boundaries of, legally of what is allowed in the spaces. No, it is okay. not at all. Okay. Uh, I have been informed by management that no uncurated art experiences are allowed in the museum ever. Okay. Um, I can, however, show it to people who specifically came with me to the museum to see it, but I'm not allowed to, um, uh, as the management called it, hoist it on unsuspecting visitors, uh, as though I were putting porn in their face or something. So, and you found this out on the eighth time? Uh, seventh. On the seventh. Yeah. Um, so you stand. I think it was seventh. So I've done it since then. So you stand in the hallway, mm -hmm. and somebody who you do not know walks by. Mm -hmm. Someone who's just walking around the museum. Are you easily identifiable? <laughs> Slightly. How? I mean, why, my how hair is very that? unique. Yeah. I wear very unique makeup. I dress in a way that most people do not dress. I am very peculiar looking. But the but you're making all of your own clothes. Yeah. And and I draw the makeup on and right. So like yeah, I definitely look like an artist. Like you would look at me and be like, that person is probably an artist. Do most of the people and most of the people who eventually go through this process don't realize that it's not connected with the space. unless they ask me. I don't say whether or not it's connected to the museum. Um, when people do ask me explicitly, I say no because that, I don't want to lie. Right. And then when I do say no, I, I usually say it's unsolicited. I don't say I'm here illegally or anything. Um, and that makes people so excited. Yeah. They're like, oh, really? That's awesome. Who are you? How can I know more about all that, that kind of thing? People really like the idea of unsolicited work in a museum space. And why was it important to do it in this space specifically? Um, it's close to where we work, and so I didn't have to take the hollands very far. But I guess mostly because the space is not, it doesn't feel like a local art space. It doesn't feel integrated into the local art scene. Um, not that I am terribly integrated in that scene, but like it doesn't feel um, like a part of the community. And also because there's what, like 2% of the artists in the museum are women. So the only, like I complained about that, nothing happened. So the only way to like actively subvert um, that paradigm is to do it yourself. Right. Like, there's no other way to subvert a museum than to just be like, well, fuck you then. Right. And, well, like, I love this building. I love SF MoMA. Like, I've really loved SF MoMA for a long time. Like, I love having an art museum. They're one of my favorite places to be. Like, I signed up as a member way well before they were open and all kinds of stuff. So I love art museums, but, like, that doesn't mean you have to love all the decisions that they make. And... You know, the fact that they took a collection and they took money from people who had a collection that 
was almost entirely male. Like the Fishers specifically collected um, very deeply in not very many artists, which is a choice on collector's part, and that's totally fine. But like, there, what? How are you? Like, there's no way to make those particular collectors' decisions. Like, the decisions of all art visiting people to the museum. Like, it just doesn't seem ethical. So. But also, the type of work you're doing. Yeah. Falls, I think <laughs> fairly outside of the comfort zone for a museum like this. Yeah. I would say the fact. Interestingly, not a very technologically sophisticated museum. Right. Which I was flabbergasted by when I first came when on the reopening. I was like, you're, you're in San Francisco. Like, right. did anybody tell you about the tech boom? Like, right. you, there's like, you could have asked anybody on the street well, for help. Not, not even that. I mean, beyond that, for, there's not, uh, you don't have a sense of performance. You don't have a no, sense of. No net art. No, like, there's very little video art in the museum. There's maybe three pieces right. at any one time. Um, yeah, it's just not a. And no it's people, not a it's no, not a rich no, yeah I have never been in this Time space based. and seen a human being rarely seen a human being doing a thing performing that was yeah. yeah I have seen one time there was a performance here that I saw um, that was a choir singing mm -hmm. um, so describe what happens once well okay um, so I say would you like to see an invisible sculpture some people say no and they keep walking and that's totally fine. Like, or they'll say, oh, I'll come back later or something. Mm -hmm. um, but most people are very curious about what you mean. Um, one in 10 people will say, uh, how am I supposed to see it if it's invisible? Nice. <laughs> Which is really funny because they say it almost in that tone of voice, like they're trying to get me. Mm -hmm. And then I always say, well, I have to give you superpowers, yeah. of course. Um, which is, they find really funny that I have like a really direct response for that question. Because they're not the first person. Yeah, yeah. no, could they, like literally every 10 people. Um, and describe the or thing itself person. that they're that um, it's a hen It's a fully integrated head-mounted computer. So other, it's not tethered to anything. It's not to my laptop or anything. It's, a, it's just a computer. You stick it on your head. And uh, it basically is like a really big donut with really, really big sunglasses on the front. Um, so you like tighten the donut to your forehead and then the big sunglasses on the front have a projector behind them and they show you something in the space. And the way that the, that works is there's basically a bunch of connects, like uh, connects from the Xbox where you could like dance in front of it and you would know you were there. You just like, they basically just slap a, a bunch of those on the front of this thing. And then it looks out in the world and it's like, where's the walls and where's the ceiling? And it tries to like sort of figure out a model of the room it's in. And then the, my piece is like, so they put the headset on and what they're seeing is a 15 foot tall hollow sculpture that was originally made out of paper that, um, how to describe. The original piece is about this big, like a foot, mm -hmm. a foot by a half a foot, somewhere in there. It's very small, it's made out of paper and glue. Uh, so then I, I did photogrammetry and made a 3D model. So the first one's made by hand. Yeah, the original is made by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I copied it using fancy photography, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then, not that original photography isn't fancy, but whatever. Yeah. Volumetric photography. Right. Um, then I just uh, make it really big, and then I set it you up in it the room. Make it big to, to, fit, to fit the space. Yeah. And I also make it big so that uh, people can go inside of it. So part of the... Fun, the, the funnest thing about the piece is like you'll have one person wearing the headset and they're doing the art I ha I'm doing rabbit ears right now like I, they're doing they're seeing the thing right. but the, the most interesting part of it is actually watching the person wearing the headset which generally there's like a crowd develops in the hallway uh, an orderly line here yeah so people so San we Francisco have, we don't have crowds people are so good at lines yeah. so it's amazing they'll just form a line and I'll be like oh okay but they're all watching the person yeah everyone screen. watches the person and then you start to like vaguely feel the size and the position of the thing in the room even though you've never seen it right. people start pointing at it and talking about it so that, even if they've never seen it so the person with the headset on becomes a performer yeah so it's like two layers like they get their own personal art experience but their body becomes a performer for everyone else's art experience mm -hmm. which is so fun so then they bring the headset back to me and then like we talk a little bit and i put it on someone else and they generally ask me questions and they you know talk to the rest of the, the, the other people watching about it um and what generally happens is like they approach it and they'll go around it and they'll like move back and forth and like lean around like you can watch their body motions and then some people you don't have to encourage, but like most of the time you have to encourage someone, like you can go inside of it. Like, did you go inside? And they'll be like, 
how do I get inside? Is there a door? No, it's made of light. You can right. just go inside. But that idea is really hard for people's, not, not their brains. People are like, oh, whatever, I can just walk inside yeah. it. But their bodies are like, but it's a sculpture. Right. You don't do this to sculptures. So it's this really interesting thing where you like, you see people's tentativeness and like their hesitation when they're like doing this thing that their body doesn't want to do, but their brain's like, no, it's okay. And you can sort of see them like encouraging their body into it. And then eventually they get inside of it and they like look up and they like, they like do all these like, they feel their body feels as though they're in this tight space, even though there is nothing there. So it's, it's and the, all of and this the inside great. has it's equal tight, textures. Yeah. It's that, just that's it's, the part that was really wonderful is when you get in, yeah. you see. There's the, more. Yeah. It's not like it's not like you're. It's not like you're inside looking out. It's yeah. like you're inside looking at. at. Yeah. yeah, which is really great. And then um, see so people do that, and you know there are little there are little details in the thing that like if you look long enough, or if you're if you're an acute enough viewer, that you'll find like there are little teeny um, windows in it, so you can see the inside from the outside. If you see these little windows, you can sort of see inside, which is something to encourage people in, but not everybody sees those kinds of things, which is, you know, it's just there for people who are more like directly attentive to the piece. Talk about the difference between that experience as compared to this experience. Compared to the Sarah? Oh, uh, right. So, um, for okay. Because like, I feel like there's a very specific thing that you are trying to accomplish that both plays off of this and is in contrast to it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess in the, like, in the history of sculpture, we've had all these different, like, orientations of, like, how objects and spaces relate to the audience members, like, walking around them or walking in between installations. And Sarah, in this particular piece, is doing this thing where the space is formed by these very, very tall walls and these very narrow hallways that like open up into sort of bubbles on the inside. Um, and it is a directed walking experience. So you walk in, you, you walk around in circles, everyone does that. And like you walk around in the hallways, maybe back and forth in these S shapes and then circles in the other bubble. And then, so, and you know, you, people also walk around the outside of it. So it's this very like sort of curvilinear, um, experience except for the fact that nobody can see you do any of that so like it's a very individual thing where you are experiencing this form but no one is experiencing you experiencing the form so it's it's one layer um, and a lot of his work is about these shapes in space and like how they relate to each other and how they relate to the space but this particular one is the only one where I've actually ever like felt how to like a really um, felt experience of the form in space of like it's being under it and, and being encompassed by it and all these things the physicality of yeah but there's no he the thing he can't achieve is throughness like there's always a door where you are allowed to walk in like he's not there telling you you can walk in but the form is telling you because there's a space there and it tells you this is where you can walk in and this is where you can leave and this is where you can move. But making holographic sculpture, like you can make an interior and an exterior with no door, with no illicit um, physical thing that tells your body where it is and isn't allowed to go, which completely it? changes the way people's body interact with it. it makes. It makes hesitation where no one's ever going to hesitate with this thing. It's like a billion pounds and like everybody touches it even though you're not supposed to. Like, like there's no hesitation because it's not going anywhere. Like you can't break the rules with this thing, right? Your body is totally comfortable in this environment. But in, a, in an environment where you're expected to literally penetrate a sculpture, your body does not want to do it. Because you've been trained your whole life not to do that, not to touch it and not to get too close to it and all this stuff. And also, like, when the form, like, it's just a difference in material, right? Like, his form is there making that shape no matter whether there's a person there or not. But my sculpture can't do that. Like, my sculpture requires there to be a participation of the audience member for it to exist at all. Like, but, it's not there yet, without a person. But yet the scale, and, I mean, you could make this form. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that you would, but I'm saying you can duplicate parts of this experience mm -hmm. just based on human scale and relationship to the object. Mm -hmm. 
except the individual experience, right? The one person at a time, which it's also worth saying that while you're looking through the lens, you're seeing kind of sections, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're not If you seeing, get very far away from it, you can see the whole thing, but, right. but generally you can't see the whole thing at once. Right. But that's true of this piece too. Right. This piece hides its interior the same way that my sculpture hides its interior. Um, but yeah, there's just, I feel like there's a difference when, when you can make monumental sculpture for nothing, for the cost of glue, mm -hmm. for paper, trash, essentially, mm -hmm. and the cost of glue. Right. And like, the headset itself is expensive, but the, the, that thing is reusable, right? Like, right. It's, like, essentially, if the headset was owned by a gallery or by the museum, any artist could make monumental sculpture. Sculpture that takes generally millions of dollars to make. Like, I have no idea how much it cost to build this thing and bring it here and install it in this room. But like, I don't have the financial resources to do that. But, and neither do most artists, but there's this opportunity to make monumental, and there's something, you know, when something, when sculpture and art is bigger than your body, your body responds to it differently. But that, lim there's a limitation of money that you can, you can bridge with these headsets. And like, yes, the headset itself is expensive, but not nearly as expensive well, as doing this. Well, but, and also, the, it's not just the expense, right? It's also the, part of these pieces for me, and part of, but Sarah is working in these large industrial situations that are meant for boats and meant mm -hmm. for, you know, really... Shipbuilding. Shipbuilding. Not just the expense, but also the hubris of saying, I'm going to go into this situation and sort of command this yeah. legion of people to do this thing mm -hmm. to, to, that they wouldn't otherwise do. And it's effective, but... I guess I'm saying this to talk about where you're touching on a little bit accessibility, but also accessibility for um, let's say you're a 19 year old student, art student, and you're female, and you are sort of you walk through the first three top floors of this building <laughs> and you say to yourself they don't want me here not only do they not want me here but like, what what is this at this point in time where there's an you know enough to know there's a history of women artists yeah. but that that space there is not reflecting them back to you and that creates this for, it even creates it for me this this gap of what I know and what I want and what I'm seeing and the notion that anybody with access to this thing so let's say not even not even being able to buy it but let's say somehow it becomes accessible where uh, another institution goes to someone and says we want you to build a sculpture we want to put we want to say the Wattis where we're mm -hmm. Wattis is this large space where they always show small work for whatever reason. And it's cheaper. Well it's well it's cheaper, but also it's a curatorial choice that I disagree with. But they can go to someone and say, hey, we want to fill the space with a sculpture. Yeah. Will you make a sculpture for this piece? And for this space? And that person all of a sudden has this flexibility and this capacity to fill the the thing that struck me about seeing it when we saw it in your studio, I didn't see it here, but that it, it in the studio, it, it took up the space in a way that, in the same way that at, for certain artists, physically they feel like they're not in the space, the, the piece, you can make a thing that like spreads out like this and says, I'm big enough and fantastic enough and like worth, you know, space, if space has value, yeah. Look how much space has been assigned. Allocated uh, for him, right, yeah. right. And look how much money and effort went into creating three floors of 
male painters, right? Like, <laughs> we yeah. knew, like you walk through and you go, oh, these, these things are not only valuable, but they're valuable because of the space they take up and the amount of effort that went into putting yeah. them in this place, blah, blah, blah. But if you can, with limited resources, take up space, physically take up space, yeah. that seems like the biggest, um, when I was in school, this is a little bit of a tangent, when I was an undergrad, um, there were a number of really amazing female sculptors. This always makes me a little sad. Went, and at some point, the, the teacher who was there, I think in my second year, left. And the school was sort of going through who to bring in. And they made a very specific choice of a very specific person who made very specific work. And he was male, and he was working in stone. And within the first term, all of the female sculptors were like, no, we're not going to operate in this situation. And they all moved into the printmaking department. Or they they were in the printmaking department anyway, and they just like fully shifted in. Yeah. And you lost, um, you know, a dozen really amazing female sculptors because that environment, the way that, envi that department was being taken up, like physically taken up by these personalities, meant that they didn't feel valued in that space or heard yeah. in that space and they just shifted into like this smaller scale <laughs> repetitious you know uh, um, and it was horrible it was really like a horrible horrible thing and uh, and I think a mistake on the school's part to a certain degree as well but but, but, but that too for me was about space and about and power and, and control yeah. and like what we value and what we don't. Right. And like those are all like <laughs> power, control, what we value, what we don't is basically what art making is about. And like if it's a, if this is a way, at least for me, to like get into those things in a way that decentralizes, yeah, decentralizes what other people consider valuable and powerful. But also people are psyched about it when they come in, right? Like, yeah. right. Tell it's me. amazing yeah. to have people be like, whoa this is so cool like in sf moma people think my work is cool which is like i know that that's just like a dorky like oh, art but it's not nerd that. thing but, what like, is, but what do it, they say it affects people in a way that none of the other work here does people ask me tons of questions about it and they ask about like and they don't just ask about the technology like it's not just about like oh how does this thing work it's about like oh why are you doing this here and like um wow it's so it's so funny like how you watch other people and like I didn't move around like that when I did it, did I? And but like all the they... components of it are visible to them. They're not, yeah. There's nothing, there's, within it, there's a basic understanding of watching the other person and then doing the thing yeah. yourself and realizing that you're changing roles, but that every time you're getting more information. Yeah. And that you're, you know, I even had yeah. a woman come up to me after and was like talking and she was like, I had never thought about looking at someone else looking at a painting before. Mm -hmm. She's like, there's so many people in this museum and I never looked at any of them before this. And I was just like, yes! Which is also, as, as someone who worked as a guard and as someone who spent a lot of time in museums, one of the best things about working in museums is watching people not only look at work, but interact with each other yeah. in those spaces because all of the dynamics play out in a very sort of wonderfully stereotypical way a yeah. lot of time. Um, and when someone's actually genuinely excited about something or engaged in something, you can it's see watching it. the right. It's yeah. watching the matter really. Yeah. It's just been really enjoyable to like blow people's minds in a way that I didn't really expect. Yeah. And they didn't expect that. That's no. Right. Yeah. And especially, there's something really great about how ephemeral it is because I don't carry business cards. Like I'll tell people like. If people ask me who I am, I'll say I'm Blink Pop Shift, and like some people write it down. But like I do not, en I don't engage with them on the level that's like I would like you to look me up on the internet. Right. Like if they want to, they'll figure out how to do that. But like I don't hand out cards. Like I don't have a sign on the wall that you can take a picture of. So there's something about it that people get really excited about and they want to know more. But then like there's this barrier that I put up intentionally. That's like, well, maybe we could just have this experience, yeah. and like you'll remember it and like think about it as part of your museum going experience 
And like, it's not that I don't want people to like no, engage no, no, with but my art, right, but, but it's just more important. You're not doing. You're not selling. You're, yeah, it, yeah. The, the ephemeral experience is more important than. Yeah, like I'm. N- I'm never going to well, sell. Well, not only piece, that, so. but the experience is enough of a thing in and of itself. Yeah. That you don't have to. I think it can survive in a very strong way without having an explanation attached yeah. to it or having whatever. And I think also probably you benefit through the contrast of the rest of the space. If the rest of the space is performative and yeah. people get to actually engage with things in a different way, they come to you and they're like, oh, this is another thing similar yeah. to this experience I'm having. But this particular place is... I'm going to use the word stodgy. It's yeah. stodgy enough that like it stands out. It push, it keeps you at arm's length. Yeah. And it, it doesn't invite you to... It's not generous. It's not inviting you to be a component. It's it, relegating you to a very specific role as viewer and a very specific role as passive viewer being told what is valuable and all of the experiences are very much like this sculpture where everything that you do is dictated and controlled by the thing and the space and you're you're you've made the choice to come in and see things but after that you're being led like you're not yeah your your choices are fairly limited as to what to buy and i think also like the ephemeralness and me not like pushing who i am is important because like part of the piece is to imagine um, the museum as I want it to be Mm -hmm. Uh, like we were talking about like like the number of women in the museum is so sad but I willingly give over like some ownership of the work to the museum because I that's what I want SFOMA to be like I want it to be a place where people experience like come across these things and experience this this sort of strange ephemeral thing that, that maybe they know about they'll and they'll tell their friends and like they when their friends come they won't see it like I want that to be what the museum is so I afford them like some idea of ownership over it because I'm doing it in their space even though they don't want me here I've been explicitly told not to do it I'm still like well, the, no, the idea of the museum wait is really important you to me. I haven't been told specifically not to do it. Yes, You've I been have. Told that you can't engage. Yeah, with I strangers. can't engage strangers. I can only engage people who specifically came with me to see it. Right. Which is which a I do, really but... funny. It's a, it's an interesting line in the sand because though. it is an interesting line, but it's also because. Oh, actually, they didn't say came. They said I can only engage my friends. Which is an even weirder yeah. notion. But I, I get. I guess. Can I just make friends with everyone? Well, or but also you're not. You're not putting anything in the space. You're not interrupting the work that's already there. You're yeah. Not, that's the thing that's amazing too about me is you figured out how to. You sort of. Part of the thing that's lovely about it is even though they've told you you can't do X, Y, Z, they can't tell you that you can't bring an invisible sculpture into the space. And part of this space also is not only what's here, but what is kept out and what is, is how carefully they guard what happens here yeah. and what's nice and appeals to me for reasons we discussed before but is that like like well I'm smart enough and have thought this through enough to do a thing in your space without your permission that technically you can't stop me from doing yeah. and that sort of infiltration and that sort of pushback if I like that pushback no matter what, but if that pushback is connected with technology or connected with a thing that they don't understand yet, then that's an amazing vehicle to transport into, again, sort of an antiquated environment that, and it goes back to that thing too that we talked about a long time ago of your experience as an undergrad 
of you making specific sort of work, which was? Oh, in grad school? Yeah. Oh, like, yeah, I was making interactive environments, what you would call a game, except for there's no play oh, and you can't win. Not only that, but the, the gifts. Oh, yeah, and just being told that none of that was that, art. That it wasn't, that it fell outside of, categorically outside of what, which art is an amazing was. thing in and of itself that anyone said that to you. <laughs> but because of the way it's distributed and the way it's created, but that um, mostly it was because they didn't understand it and they didn't know how to, where if to you put can't it critique to... it, if they couldn't critique it, it wasn't art. Right. Because they knew how to critique art, so what I was making wasn't art. Right. It was like a very simple equation for them. Right. But that that's the same equation here of, well, you can't do this in the space. Well, can't I? Like, what rule am I breaking? Okay, well, they have to be your friends. Yeah. Which is is not, we. you know what I mean? Like, it, it feels like... It feels like part of the strength of the thing is that it doesn't read to them as art. Yeah. Even though it is functioning in an even more interesting way than the things they have. Yeah. In so, hey, you want to have a podcast? <laughs> I think we should have a podcast. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's do this. Bye. I was, did it, was it so, oh, good. Okay. Yeah, it's oh, so recording. Oh, half an hour, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. Okay, goodbye, humans. Wait, goodbye, everybody.